Welcome here. I'm Gail Nunziata. I am managing director of the new Latches Arts. We are just loving the new name and the new graphics and the new energy. Uh, same mission, same folks, uh, but we're just really pleased to be moving forward in this way. My housekeeping duty is to remind you to, you know, turn off your cell phones and all that. All right? Thank you very much. And that's really it for me. I'm just delighted to have Ken Burns here. I'm delighted that the Vermont Humanities Council brings him to us uh, every year. And now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Jerry Carboni, Library Director. Thank you, Gail, and all of you for coming tonight. This lecture tonight is indeed one of the highlights of our 2011-2012 First Wednesday Lecture Series. We have our sponsor, Vermont Humanities Council, to thank for this great series which for Brattleboro is in its sixth season this year. And tonight, I can actually do that personally because Peter Gilbert, its ex executive director, is here to introduce Ken Burns. As you may know, uh, Vermont Humanities Council partners with public libraries all over the state produce First Wednesday programs. In 2012, there are nine libraries that host these lectures, get the word out, and provide the boots on the ground support to bring these fine programs to all Vermont citizens. All around Vermont tonight, people are sitting in libraries to see, hear, and interact with their neighbors and scholars and practitioners who work with humanities every day. Forgive me, Google and Facebook, but I'm sorry to say that what happens on first Wednesday of every month at 7 p.m. in a Vermont public library is not something the digital world can easily replicate. So let me have a few moments to, of your time to acknowledge the other people and organizations that make these eight lectures possible. Besides the stalwart program and statewide sponsors that Peter will uh, mention, we have our local library community sponsors that provide support. Thanks to the uh, Friends of the Library. Uh, they are those board members who were sitting at the uh, table in the entrance as you walked in the theater tonight. And I thank them for all their hard work this year to raise the matching funds that are required to provide the lecture series. And thanks to the library trustees for their support they give to all library services and programs. We couldn't do it without you. You can help support the library and the Vermont Humanities Council by becoming a friend of the library and a VHC uh, member. Our other sponsors include local companies that have donated funds for our local match. That include Brattleboro Savings and Loan, Downs Rackland Martin, and the Wyndham World Affairs Council of Vermont. So now please welcome Vermont Humanities Council Executive Director Peter Gilbert. Thank you, Jerry. There isn't a uh better Vermont Humanities Council um, library, First Wednesdays uh, host in the entire state of Vermont than uh, Jerry Carboni and the uh, Brooks and Mar <laughs> right here and in eight other Vermont communities. Hundreds of people are gathered to hear from and interact with eminent scholars, authors, and experts. Tonight, they are learning about in these eight other sites, daily life in pre-war Nazi Germany, the dispute between India and Pakistan over Kashmir, Vermonters in the Civil War, the history of the Vermont landscape, the intimate privilege of being with someone who is dying, the performance of tragedies in ancient Athens, what makes a classic Hollywood film, and youth in foster care from a Vermont filmmaker who just made a movie on the subject. First Wednesday's talks happen on the first Wednesday of every month from October through May, strengthening communities, supporting libraries, and promoting lifelong learning. The statewide First Wednesday's program is funded in part by the Vermont Department of Libraries. Tonight's program is funded by the law firm of Dakin and Benelli PC in Chester. So special thanks to, to Bill Dakin and Penny Benelli. The Vermont Humanities Council believes that the world of ideas belongs to everyone, and that engagement with the world of ideas contributes uniquely to richer lives, stronger communities, and a more humane society. The Council runs about 1,200 programs a year. About half of them are for the general public. They include not only the First Wednesdays, but among other things, Vermont Reads. Vermont Reads which is the Council's one-book statewide community reading program. 
where Attleboro, I am pleased to say, has participated every year in Vermont Reads since the program began in 2003. Last year, thousands of people, students and adults alike around the state, read uh, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird. The previous year, people in more than 100 towns read Catherine Patterson's novel, The Day of the Pelican, and participated in a variety of activities related to the book. Um, now, our country is in the um, midst of the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, and so the Vermont Reads book for 2012 is Paul Fleischman's Bull Run, a compelling and accessible novel not so much about the battle as about the times and the people of Civil War America. The other half of the Humanities Council's programs are literacy programs for targeted, underserved audiences, including child care providers, middle school students, teen parents, adult basic education students, and men and women in Vermont's prisons. The Vermont Humanities Council is not part of Vermont state government. It's a statewide nonprofit organization, and it relies on donations, much as your local library does, for its support. And so, needless to say, we're glad you're here. We're um, um, uh, grateful for your interest and for your support, not only for us, but for your local library. About the United States, Robert Frost wrote to a friend, we are sure to be great in the world of power and wealth. But someone who has time will have to take thought that we shall be remembered 5,000 years from now for more than success in war and trade. Someone will have to feel that it would be the ultimate shame if we were to pass like Carthage, great in war and trade, and leave no trace in the spirit. For Frost, real national greatness comes from the humanities and the arts, from literature and history. It is the humanities that help us understand the spirit that makes us human and that can make a nation great. That spirit informs all the work of the Vermont Humanities Council and also the work of Ken Burns. It's a special treat to have Ken here tonight. Born in Brooklyn, he graduated from Hampshire College in 1975 and he's been making documentary films for more than 30 years, beginning with the Academy Award-nominated Brooklyn Bridge in 1981. He's directed and produced some of the most acclaimed historical documentaries ever made, including Baseball, The War, National Parks, America's Best Idea, and of course, The Civil War. Colonist George Will said, if better use has ever been made of television, I have not seen it and do not expect to see better until Ken Burns turns his prodigious talents to his next project. Well, tonight, uh, Ken is going to be talking about some of his uh, recent and his upcoming projects, films that help us understand who we are as Americans by examining our shared past. Now, uh, uh, before uh, uh, Ken comes out, we're going to show a brief uh, film clip. But let me say that I hope you will join me in welcoming a gifting, gifted and generous neighbor from Walpole, New Hampshire, an inspiring cinematographer, an exquisite wordsmith, and an American idealist, Ken Burns. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the first night of the Vermont caucus. Um, <laughs> we're, we're glad you're here and that uh, pretty soon we'll be breaking up into small groups to decide uh, our preferences. Um, no, I'm actually happy this is not first Tuesday, but first uh, Wednesdays. 
and uh, something I've participated before in, uh, coming across uh, from New Hampshire, which of course next Tuesday has the first in the nation primary, um, to join you all, and it's been a great pleasure to do this, and I'm particularly happy to be back in the Latches and thank Gail for her hospitality, and Jerry and the Brooks Memorial Library, and of course my friend Peter for the extraordinary work that the Vermont Humanities uh, Council does to stitch this remarkable uh, state together in, in hugely uh, important ways. I was a little bit anxious as I walked in the door because I noticed that the two other films that are showing tonight um, are both directed by Steven Spielberg. And, um, <laughs> you know, you want to go to Gail and say, thanks a lot, you know. <laughs> It could have been some, you know, obscure foreign film that could have been playing right now, but it's like War Horse and Tintin, two Steven Spielberg first releases that are, are playing here. So, but I'm, I'm, um, I'm glad uh, that you made this choice, and I hopefully you'll be glad uh, at the end of the evening um, that you're doing it. But I first want to thank you for your uh, support <clears throat> of this extraordinary uh, institution. Um, in the clip you just saw, and by the way, the raciest footage that you saw there where there's a young woman pulling off her sweater, uh, we had initiated a nationwide search uh, for home movies, uh, very, very rare during the 20s, uh, during the age of prohibition. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, some did come forward. Um, and we cast our net far and wide across the country, putting ads in paper, uh, and by far the best footage uh, was this reel of just drunken partiers um, <clears throat> from Brattleboro, Vermont. <laughs> uh, I, I can't begin to tell you the dimensions this added to our filmmaking. Uh, uh, every time you look at your grandmother or your great-grandmother and think that they're somehow stodgy, that they can't possibly know anything, you re will then wake up and realize how incredibly ahistorical you are, uh, that they were enjoying incredible sex in the 1920s, and that ahistoricalness, if that's a word, uh, is a horrible thing to find yourself in, which sort of leads us to another important theme that I thought happened in Prohibition. Prohibition, by the way, was broadcast uh, last October uh, on PBS and why it sort of looked and sounded pretty good uh, on, on this crude DVD that we're uh, projecting uh, for you this evening. What struck us as we were working on the film is uh, something from Ecclesiastes, that there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, when we think about prohibition, we normally think about gangsters and flappers, and they're in the film and they're there in great quantities and it's exciting and dramatic and violent and scary. But what struck us more was how similar it was today, that had I not told you what the subject of the film I was working on was, but instead said that for several years we had been working on a film about um, single-issue political campaigns that metastasize with horrible unintended consequences <laughs> politically and socially for the country, about the demonization of recent immigrants to the United States, about unfunded congressional mandates, about smear campaigns during presidential election cycles, about a whole group of people who feel like they've lost control of the country and have decided and are determined to take it back. Uh, of, of a startlingly new feminist women's liberation movement. I mean, these are a handful of the themes that Prohibition turned out to be really about, that the superficial um, attraction that we have to the flapper era, uh, to the gangster era, is just that, superficial. And that it was possible to embrace that, to not ignore it, uh, as we so often do as the pendulum of history swings one way or the other, uh, but to include it but also sort of cast our net a little bit farther and try to ask questions about how it happened and see the 100-year um, run-up to Prohibition that begins with Lyman Beecher and his sermons and ends with the, an amendment to the Constitution that is going to, as we say, turn millions and millions of Americans uh, into lawbreakers and what those unintended consequences are about. I mean, in some ways we should have just quit after Mark Twain. I mean. 
<laughs> no one, you know, has ever written more perfectly in the American language, I believe, than Mark Twain. And nothing so needs reforming as other people's habits has got to rank up there. My personal favorite is actually, it's not that the world is filled with fools, it's just that lightning isn't distributed right. <laughs> Mark Twain is in some ways a key to, at least perhaps for me, organizing what can happen this evening. And I hope very much to have you participate in it in the form of questions um, so that it will be a conversation unless me speaking at you. I say Mark Twain because during the course of producing a film on Mark Twain, which Dayton Duncan and I did at the end of the 90s, uh, we had the great good fortune to interview Russell Banks, who is a great American, contemporary American novelist. And when he was speaking about Huckleberry Finn, uh, recalling uh, that uh, Ernest Hemingway had said that all American literature begins with Twain's masterwork, Huckleberry Finn, um, he also then went on to say that it's our Iliad and our Odyssey, and which, which really sort of stopped me cold. He said, because although most of us share the same European um, ancestors as those who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, we in America were grappling with new themes, particularly two new themes that the Iliad and the Odyssey was disinterested in, didn't even consider, and, and weren't really uh, part of the sort of the zeitgeist of that time and therefore of the subsequent generations that would live under the spell of the Iliad uh, and so um, he said that those twin themes, and Twain alone, he said, among writers and artists of the 19th century, Twain alone was willing to confront both of them the way no one else did. And he said that those twin themes were race and space. And I don't mean outer space, I mean the physical geography of the United States, that the peculiar circumstances of us being bordered by two mighty oceans and two relatively benign neighbors, north and south, have insulated us from a lot of the vicissitudes of history and permitted a different kind of history to unfold here. Complicated to be sure, dark to be sure, but also different. And that of course, here we were, a nation founded on the principle that all men are created equal, yet the man who coined that famous second sentence of the Declaration owned more than 100 human beings as he wrote that sentence and never saw fit in his lifetime to free any one of them, set in motion an American narrative that was always going to be parsed, as it is today, about questions of race. And as, as Russell Banks said this, and it's in our Twain film, I, I felt that he was describing what we had been struggling to do then for 20 years, now for more than 30, in, in the subjects that we approach uh, in the United States, to deal with the sheer beauty and the physicality uh, of this continent, and also the way in which issues of race continually pop up. It's impossible to scratch the surface of American history without doing that. As we all know, we have recently as a country, like most of the other countries of the world, uh, have been going through really difficult economic times. And they've coincided also, to go back to the caucus, uh, with a really divided polity in which most of us are so dialectically preoccupied that we see ourselves as red state or blue state, uh, black or white, male or female, gay or straight, north or south, east or west, rather than what we really are, which is Americans, which makes what the Vermont humanities and, and the work it does stitches together. And what I would suggest is one of the positive aspects of history. We recently formed to sort of overcome the incredible uh, difficulties and uphill slog that fundraising is in these uh, days, uh, created a, a group called, a fundraising group called the Better Angel Society after Lincoln's first inaugural because we realize that history is still a table around which we can all still agree to cohere, around which those people quite often can leave, if only for a moment, uh, the biases and the distinguishing uh, that preoccupy their waking lives, um, and a way in which we can transcend those different uh, barriers of, of geography or of race or of sex or of uh, politics, of religion, all of the things that we use uh, superficially to try to convince ourselves that the other is just that, the other and not someone so incredibly similar to us. It seems to me that what the purpose of having a library is, 
is, what the purpose of having a place where we can gather and have a conversation is, what the purpose of the humanities are, what the purpose, we hope, of the films that we have tried to make over the last 30 years is to engage a conversation in which we can perhaps for a moment be free of these labels, be free of these kinds of things, and engaged in a shared past. And so that's what I've been doing for the last 35 years, and it's been extraordinarily satisfying. I always like to brag that I have the best job in the country, that it educates all my parts, and that I'm always quite willing to be corrected by someone else who says, no, 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 they have the best job in the country, because that's a really good thing. Um, and, and I don't mind sharing that. Uh, it's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, I, I do do that because I work with an extraordinary number of people. I work in a medium that is deservedly much maligned. It uses such a small percentage of its own brain and yet has an incredibly powerful force. Before we went on, uh, Peter and I were talking and I had just learned a statistic um, about, uh, uh, about sort of, you know, what, the way this medium works. Colonial Williamsburg, which is maybe, maybe some of you have visited it or perhaps heard about it, is perhaps the most famous uh, of all the historical sort of museum sites, living, uh, breathing uh, museum sites in the United States. It's been open since 1932, and since 1932 to the present, uh, they've had 100 million visitors, which is an extraordinary amount of people. In September of 1990, PBS first broadcast our series on the Civil War. If you take all the people who just watched the premiere of that film and then the premiere of all the subsequent films up to Prohibition, not including the rebroadcasts, not the foreign stuff, not the DVD, but just the premieres, the first time it was shown on PBS, it's 340 million people which is an extraordinary sense of the possibility of this medium and the possibility of it to hopefully do good, to certainly reach a number of people, to perhaps galvanize action, to move them off the couches and out into the national parks, say, to Civil War battle sites, particularly as we spend the next four, three and a half years um, coming to terms with the sesquicentennial. Um, and so this is a good job, and I'm happy to be able to spend a few minutes with you this evening to share with things. And what I want to do is share with you three other clips and uh, talk a little bit about the films uh, as we're doing them. Prohibition was the last uh, film that we've released. The next three clips are all films that we're, will be in the future. So you are the first human beings outside of the editing room to see any of this stuff. And um, as we get farther along, we'll get cruder and cruder in terms of uh, what you'll be looking at. And I'll try to provide adequate warning and caveats as we go farther. But I hope that uh, if I'll shut up and we get these uh, total of four clips, including Prohibition, out of the way, that um, I'm not here. Um, <laughs> that uh, we'll be able to have a conversation and whether the clips unite some ideas together or that individually they promote ideas or questions, uh, that will be, I think, the ultimate success of this evening. So anyway, what I'd like to do, and by the way, I'm not only the speaker tonight, I am the lighting director. Uh, so uh, I'd like to roll the second clip, but that can't happen until I go back and turn off the lights. Um, because, you know, we New Englanders are flinty and God forbid, we should have too many people on a job, right? <laughs> Please watch the second clip. So the Dust Bowl is a two-part, four-hour, almost oral history of that period. You know, for most of the life of this republic, the way we have told our history is from the top down. This has been called the history of the state, and it basically focuses only on wars and generals and presidents, you know the socio-political military history, and, and that's not a bad history, uh, but it's not the only history. And in the case of the Dust Bowl, with the exception of a couple historians, the people who narrate our story are witnesses to this 10-year uh, apocalyptic uh, environmental disaster that, that we created. And it may be actually the worst um, environmental catastrophe in the history of the world, at least so far. Um, it, we found, we were able to find in the panhandle of Oklahoma 
and the Panhandle of Texas and the surrounding corners of uh, southwestern Kansas and southeastern Colorado and northeastern um, uh, New Mexico, a, a group of people who had uh, survived this as children, uh, young kids, often teenagers, and are now in their 80s or 90s and can recall it as if it was yesterday. You know, it, it's funny that we tend to assume that memory is distant. Memory is actually present. And when we realize that, we understand the way in which um, it, can, it can have a powerful influence. There are moments here uh, when people are recalling the death of their siblings uh, that you would feel as if you were in this small one-room basement house. Uh, they hadn't yet been able to afford, uh, you know, nothing more than kind of a sod buster's house only framed basement house where there's seven kids in this one room and one of them is your little sister who's dying of the dust pneumonia and the way two 90 year old brothers recall it as if it was today is because it is and one essential ingredient i think we've come to understand over the last 35 years is how present the past is it sounds cliched but but how much it is informing everything. I mean, if you witnessed a couple days ago, one of the candidates running for president of the Republican Party, Newt Gingrich, uh, broke down, cried, recalling his mother's illness. And, you know, it was, you know, it's, it's become a kind of political football, but it shows you the power in which history and memory can overcome and overwhelm people. Um, this program uh, is essentially done. Uh, you saw it, minus some sound effects there, but it will uh, essentially be, be completed within the next um, few weeks, and we'll broadcast it uh, after the election in sort of mid to late uh, November, uh, just to not get blindsided or sideswept by some debate or uh, developing information in a contest that I'm sure everyone in this room is interested in following. Um, <laughs> We we're, we're also need that time because unlike uh, the rich premium channels like HBO, we in public television have to do our lighting and our speaking, and so we uh, travel across the country uh, uh, to sort of let people know about its existence, and that's uh, time consuming, but very direct and permits us to show uh, many more clips than the introduction. And by the way, all I'm showing today are the introductions of films. Uh, because I thought it was better not to spend a lot of time dropping you into them. Now the next clip I want to show is for um, a film that is in the middle of editing. So the biggest caveat and apology is you will not hear the remarkable voice of Peter Coyote reading the words of our writer Jeff Ward or uh, Dayton Duncan in the case of Prohibition or the Dust Bowl respectively. Uh, but the person reading Jeff Ward's fine script for this next uh, film is me. I am, the, I am what's called the scratch narrator through 99% of the process. And just think about it, it doesn't make sense to have Peter come in and read, uh, or Dr David McCullough come in and read, or anybody come in and read the first draft when it's gonna go through 20 iterations. You want him to read the last draft so they're not just you know, constantly coming back. It's time consuming and expensive. So I do all of that because like the expense for the lighting director tonight, I am free. And um, so I do that. Also, before we pay for uh, the rights, where we know the picture is locked, we're done editing, we know we want this photograph, or we want this piece of newsreel, or we want this, we get low resolution photographs, sometimes with a watermark that makes it, you know, hard to read the pristine thing. They don't look clear and sharp and HD as it will all be or the footage might have watermark or even time code running under it. And we have to spend the whole editing looking through, whole editing process, sometimes many years, in the case of a big series, looking through that. Um, now, I'm asking you to extend us this courtesy for this clip and the next one to understand that you'll have to look through of that and you'll be sort of peering behind the curtain and looking a little bit at our unfinished project. And I think if you extend that courtesy, you'll be able to see at least intention uh, behind the perhaps distracting madness of, of these first clips. So um, I'd like very much, uh, you also remember that Peter very interestingly and kindly quoted George Will's um, 
uh, quote about me for the Civil War series. Very, very nice. Often people in introductions do that. You might remember Spy Magazine uh, in the 1980s and, and 90s before it went out of business. It used to have a column called Log Rolling in Our Time. And it basically showed the blurb that somebody gave to somebody and then the blurb that they gave to that other person on the books that they wrote. And it was to show how it's a small group. And well, you'll find George Will in this next clip. And uh, it's not because of the nice things he said, but because he's actually uh, really good at understanding the dynamics of uh, the past. And in this case, the particular uh, story that, complicated story, that we're trying to tell. Peter also referred to a kind of, uh, or, or Jerry did, about a sense of, of the scope and the scheme and the arc of things. You'll find in this introduction to the next series an equally interesting consideration. When you realize that the United States of America is barely 200 years, we're not even 150 years from when we actually said in law, all men are created equal. And yet, there is embedded in American sort of being, something that we run up against, a very dangerous idea of exceptionalism, but also a sense of confidence and a sense of possibility. And I think you'll hear that in one of the bites and, and see uh, one of these things, a project we've been working on for many years. It has many years to go because of the size and scope of it. But let's roll the third uh, clip, please. Thank you. So there are 14 more hours to go. Uh, this is a seven part, a uh, little bit over 14 hour series at this moment. And it is really got us all by the throat and by the scruff of our necks and most importantly by our heart. What you didn't hear in this introduction is that the intimate history is not the only way we tell the story. It's obviously a broad top down as well as bottom up. Uh, I mean, bottom-up as well as top-down story. And one of the ways that we try to bring in that intimacy is to uh, use the letters and diaries and journals of these very, very famous people. In the case of Theodore Roosevelt, recorded once or twice inconsequentially. Uh, but Franklin, as you saw, and Eleanor were recorded frequently, but to find people who could read them. And we were able to, and, and others in their circle, one of the great... Um, discoveries of recent years made by Jeffrey C. Ward, our writer, and as you saw for the first time with us on camera because of his expertise on the Roosevelts, um, he discovered that Franklin had a long, a distant cousin named Daisy Sookley, who was brought in by Franklin's mother, Sarah, after he was stricken with polio in the summer of 1921, uh, to sort of provide company for him. She pulled him out of Manhattan where he lived up to Springwood in Hyde Park and brought this uh, cousin who became one of his closest companions ever. And Roosevelt surrounded himself always with adoring um, people, particularly women, who would sort of provide a buffer with the world. He was a very interesting, insulated human being, gregarious and generous, utterly self-confident, but also um, very rarely showed his cards to anyone, certainly not his wife. Uh, though they had a, a, and remain to have, even after extraordinary betrayals, amazing uh, relationship up to the very end. But the, this coterie of the very young included uh, Daisy Sookley, who kept a journal and saved his letters. And his letters reveal for the first time the only complaint about uh, polio that's ever been recorded, many other things. And we were fortunate to get uh, the actress pa Patricia Clarkson uh, to read uh, Daisy's voice. We got. Um, Edward Herman, who has played FDR in movies and miniseries on television, to do FDR uh, and to not compete or, or clash with uh, the external public newsreels that we use quite frequently, particularly in the later episodes. And um, Paul Giamatti reads uh, TR in a new and I think interesting way. TR is utterly crazy and <laughs> really a wonderful, wonderful, exasperating uh, wonderful uh, figure in history that we've gotten to know 
uh, very well. And um, a little known actress uh, named Meryl Streep reads um, <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt. And when Jeff came into the studio, which he rarely does to listen to the voice recordings that I direct, and we had sent her some of Eleanor's um, uh, newsreels just so that she could study them, and she read the first quote, he burst into tears because it felt like there was Eleanor Roosevelt just through that glass uh, partition. And so we're very much looking forward to sharing this intimate but also broad uh, social history. It's, it's interesting that when we think about histories, we rarely think about one of the essential aspects of the DNA of that of that thing, history, and that's families. The families are at the heart of the prohibition story, uh, trying to, to save the families that are torn asunder by alcohol, trying to figure out how you will uh, enforce something as unenforceable as prohibition, not so much within a country, but, uh, but within families. How will we discipline ourselves? What are our responsibilities? It's families in the Dust Bowl that are at the heart of the story. This is obviously the most important uh, family in American history in terms of their influence on, on other human beings, uh, influence that is felt to this day, influence that's obviously uh, being debated this day. Uh, and families uh, of a different sort are at the heart of this next uh, clip that I want to pay you. We've had to switch reels and hopefully the startup of that. Um, you very kindly look through some of the crudities. This is even more crude. This is a, uh, a film that will be out before the Roosevelt's, but it's, it's um, you know, e even rougher. Uh, it's a, it's, uh, well, I won't say anything. Uh, well, let's run, run this clip and then I look forward uh, to having a, a conversation with you about all of these films and about the ideas not only that I've brought up, uh, but ones I hope that are sponsored by your thoughts and feelings uh, this evening. So uh, let's roll the final clip. something a little bit different, but still the impact of this story as you see on uh, the five families of these boys uh, is tremendous. Before it's broadcast on PBS, we hope to have a theatrical distribution of this film and uh, we hope to be back here and that you'll see it all fresh and I thank you again for looking through all of the, the out of focus and fuzzy and poorly resolved stuff and all the time code and the watermarks and things like that. Uh, suffice to say, when this film is done editing, which still has a ways to go, um, it will be free of all of that. And uh, I look forward to coming back and hope that you will too to see what happens. Um, it is about families and what's been particularly exciting about this film for me is that it's also produced and directed by my son-in-law and my daughter, uh, along with me. Uh, my daughter is one of the world's foremost experts on this case. I just published a book uh, this past spring on the Central Park Jogger case, and particularly focusing on the five uh, black and Hispanic boys who were falsely accused and went to jail for a crime they didn't commit. And we have been not making a film of her book, this is an entirely different film, but something that engages the same themes that we've engaged in, but as I think you saw, in a little bit different way. Um, in our reti uh, remaining time together, I'd like very much to um, uh, have a conversation. And if we can turn on the house lights, and I believe there's a microphone that will be brought down to the, to the aisle. Um, I think it's right up, is it here? Oh, it's already up there. Oh, there it is. Where Peter is, if you want to ask a question, uh, please don't hesitate. The house lights will come on in a second and we'll uh, be able to see each other or I'll be able to see you. Hey. Oh. Um, and if you're too shy, tell your neighbor to ask a question for you. In any case, there's the microphone. Go to it or shout out your question. Maybe I'll be able to hear it. Yes, sir. I'm very interested in making a documentary about American torture and the work of ending American torture. 
which is still a concern. Um, and I would like it to be a documentary that would be as effective in uh, moving America as Al Gore's documentary on the environment was. Where does one begin? <laughs> it's a good question. You know, if you wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer or um, a feature filmmaker, I could tell you the correct path to take. Uh, there are steps uh, to do that, but every documentary filmmaker that I know that's working and established has arrived at that uh, place from completely unique ways. Uh, one way of saying it is that there's no career path, which is both a blessing and of course a curse. I can't tell you anything other than sort of platitudes and verities of, of, of you know, knowing who you are and persevering because that's what it always takes. I mean, there are a lot more talented filmmakers uh, than me, but I've just been dogged at it and refused to give up when people said, for my first film, this child is trying to sell me the Brooklyn Bridge and, uh, you know, just kept going uh, from that. Uh, I wish you luck with that, but it just requires that beginning with local PBS is not a bad idea, but these are tough times and they barely have funds to support themselves. They're laying off people, so it's harder to bring on other people, but I think finding the right combination of filmmakers and, and people with passion is always what gets things done. I, I don't mean to be platitudinous, but I have to be uh, in the case of that and just say that, that I wish you and I believe a lot of people wish you very, very well. I'd like to see if you would talk a little bit about the importance of having a mentor like Jerry Liebling in your life and how his role as an educator helped you and got you started? Uh, uh, July 27th, this past July 27th, uh, Jerome Liebling, who was uh, an extraordinary uh, filmmaker and particularly a photographer, but even more than that, a teacher, uh, passed away at the age of 87. He was my mentor. He was my father figure. He taught at Hampshire College from 1970 until his retirement. In 91, uh, we rem I graduated in 1975. We remain very, very close friends. Uh, I was with him just before he passed away. I uh, buried him uh, a couple days later. I, I can't even begin to start to tell you how fortunate I feel. Uh, every time you see the use of a still photograph in my film, uh, it's Jerry. You know, anything you don't like is just me. Um, the the we had the most amazing situation. I mean, you'd think that film and photography would be naturally put together. It rarely is. Photography is often part of fine arts. Film is out of English or communications, architecture in various schools, communication stuff that, that doesn't see their similarities. But Hampshire, small and intimate, found film and photography to be uh, sort of brothers and sisters uh, together. And so we were taught by still photographers and filmmakers, and we were taught alongside of other photographers and other filmmakers. And we sort of grew up under Jerry's aegis, uh, an attitude uh, about, I believe, or at least what I took away was the power of the individual image to convey complex information without undue manipulation. And that has served me from the first film that I've worked on to the last. I, you know, it's been a very painful several months without him. There's a huge gap in all of our lives, those of us who knew him. Uh, he was not only an extraordinary artist and teacher, but a, 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 a remarkable human being and mensch. Um, my children have loved him, and he's loved them. And, and um, just before he died, I, I'm a new grandfather, and he said, I'm going to, I want to give your granddaughter something and just yesterday his widow delivered the the picture to us or just the other day the, his widow delivered it and yesterday i watched my daughter and son-in-law open it up for their granddaughter which was an amazing photograph of just a baby's arm sticking out of a little papoose or something and the mother's larger arm next to it and that's it you no context no nothing other than just a kind of universal uh, thing that we've all experienced or will experience in our life. And during these last few months, there have been moments when I've literally stopped and broken down in the editing room in the Roosevelt's, in the Central Park Five, in the Dust Bowl, because the DNA of our work is a still photograph and our relationship to it. And all of that came from Jerry. And so, you know, what's really great about being a good artist is that 
you, you have a kind of immortality that many of us don't always have because the work lives on. And it's possible, for example, if you're in New York City to go to the Jewish Museum, where they're having a spectacular exhibition on the Photo League, uh, which was this left-leaning, ultimately banned by the government, had to be disbanded, a uh, set of still photographers sort of insisting on a, on a, on a, on America looking at how it really was, not just how it liked to see itself, and took amazing photographs, particularly uh, urban photographs, and many of Jerry's photographs are in that exhibition, and, and they're remarkable, or just go online and uh, read the Times obit, or the, the Times of London did a full page on it that was really, uh, took his life into consideration, but without Jerry, I would not be standing here before, so thank you for the opportunity uh, to honor him. Yes. There are so many terrific stories out there, American stories and even more stories worldwide. What, how do you winnow it down and say, this is the one? You hear that? How many, there are lots of stories out there. How do you, you know, winnow it down and say, this is the one? Uh, it's often said uh, in a work of art that you don't complete it, you abandon it. And that's, there's a huge amount of truth in that. Uh, for us, the essence is story. I mean, the word history is mostly made up of story. I'm not a historian. I'm a storyteller. That's what a filmmaker is. And um, I'm in the business of trying to figure out how to tell a story. And when we first looked at the Central Park Five, where we, what we have is what's called an assembly at the beginning, where you're sort of, there's no script in this. It's just we've thrown everything in in more or less chronological order to see what you've got. It was about four hours long. It's now under two hours. And it, a, a huge amount of stuff just is lost that's good. You, you remember the movie Amadeus, when Franz Joseph said, too many notes? I mean, that is really one of the great truths of all time. I mean, something can really work. Dayton Duncan, my partner on the Mark Twain film, still will not forgive me for taking out this incredible scene that was incredible early on in the biography, uh, quoting from uh, Life on the Mississippi, that was also a biography of, of the little town that he grew up in, Hannibal, Missouri, about the inactivity, and then a steamboat comes around the bend and parks at the wharves, and everybody, the town comes to life, and then the steamboat is unloaded, and it leaves, and then everything goes back to being sleepy. It was wonderful, called White Town Drowsing. I mean, just one of the greatest works of, you know, just a, a page of great, great stuff. But somehow, about 20 minutes later, you'd sort of bog down and tire. And I just said, let's pull this out. And Dayton, I thought, was going to die. And I said, look, if you, if you don't, we'll put it back in. We took it out, and everything worked, you know. But he'd come in, bags under his eyes, been up all night. I said, OK, we'll put it back in. We put it back in, the same problem would happen. And this went on for six months of editing. We were working on other things. But I wanted to honor my partner's you know, anxiety about losing this right arm of his. Um, so it's not in the film. Uh, as he likes to say, thank God for DVD extras. Um, uh, because it's, it's in the DVD extra. But, and you can see, you can look at this. And you go, you're an idiot. This is an amazingly good scene, but it was destabilizing. So within a subject, that's how it gets pared down. But there's a story. Every one of us is a story. And every one of us has, there is a way to take each one of our experiences and turn it into an interesting story. And that just is how you approach it, what materials you use, the perseverance and the passion that you have for it, all of those things. I mean, if I were given a 1,000 years to live, which I will not be given, I will never run out of topics in American history. I mean, I know, I've got, I'm working on eight films right now. We're doing a biography of Ernest Hemingway. We're doing a huge multi-part series on the history of country music. I'm shooting a two-part biography on Jackie Robinson, though he was central to our original big baseball series. He deserves his own kind of standalone uh, story. We've got the prohibition just out of the way. We're working on, you know, the Dust Bowl is in the finishing touches. You've seen the Roosevelts. You've seen parts of uh, Central Park Five. We're working on a huge, there was a, the Pulitzer Prize winning nonfiction book last year was a history of cancer called The Emperor of All Maladies. And we are working on a project of how do you tell that story, that if in fact we are, if in fact it is the emperor of all maladies, then we are all its subjects. 
and that somehow we have to form a resistance movement to figure out what to do with that because there's no one in this room who hasn't been touched by it or knows somebody incredibly close to them by this disease. And a wonderful oncologist, uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee, who's also a poet, wrote this great work of literature that we're also trying to turn into the film. And probably, I won't say most important because I love these projects as if they were each my children. Uh, we have been working for the last few years and will continue to work for the next uh, four years on a history of the Vietnam War. We are very, very deep in it, having done a couple dozen interviews. Uh, it, it is a difficult and, and hard project to figure out what stories to tell, but it will be intimate and, and bottom up, and we've talked to um, an amazing array of human beings. And well, the Civil War, you could ultimately say, brought the country together and ended slavery. The Second World War, both subjects of films we've done, ended. Uh, the, the, the tyranny of fascism and the militarism uh, of Japan. Um, there's nothing redeeming about the Vietnam War. Uh, but we've taken a little bit from Viktor Frankl, the Holocaust survivor, who said to live is to suffer, to survive is to find meaning in the suffering. And they're remarkable human beings who've given us these interviews willing to open up their hearts to their, more often than not, painful, life-altering, in not very good ways, experiences is to see the way in which each of these individuals have tried to make sense of something that cannot make sense. And that our story then becomes uh, a narrative of human perseverance and the way in which you can um, get out beyond the specifics. You know, when you look for this moment in art, in a photograph that Jerry would take, where one in one doesn't equal two, but equals three, and that's what we look for in our own lives, what we look for all the time, that that combination perhaps of sound and image is more than, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Yes? You're not, you say you're not a historian, you're a storyteller, but all of your stories are told with historical perspective. Yes. Is, is that necessary that a story have historical perspective for you? Uh, yeah, I, am, I am not a historian. I'm trained as a filmmaker, but all of the films that I've done have been in American history, with the exception of a couple of smaller films that I've made. Uh, and that's just because I found what I wanted to do. I was very fortunate that history was the thing that I'm untrained in. The last time I took a course in American history was 11th grade, where they hold a gun to your head and insist that you take American history. And it was not a very satisfying thing, but I, I somehow you know, op opened myself up to history in the course of what I was doing, and um, that seems to be. I, I would have never thought at the end of the Brooklyn Bridge film, which was the first film for public television, if you told me that 30 plus years later I'd still be making films in American history, I'd say you're crazy. I figured that the next film would be different. But each one has been in that, and I have not tired from it. And as I said, you know, we are just bursting at the seams and trying to figure out how to raise money, but also how to just find the time uh, to do that. Yes? Have you ever endeavored to take on a project or a story that has sort of defeated you at some point and you weren't able to complete? That what? That you were not able to complete? Did I ever take on a project that I was not able to uh, complete? No, I feel extraordinarily for, uh, fortunate about that. I did have an experience where for many years people said, what's the project that you want to do uh, that you haven't yet done? And I always say, I, I think I am the person to do a biography of Martin Luther King. I think I, I can really do that. And it's not been done well, and it needs to be done well. But the family is difficult, and I don't, I don't want to come to you and apologize for something. It was very I ironic because a few years later, I received a letter from the family saying, we think you're the only person to do this film. <laughs> And I was brought before all the members of the family, this is many, many years ago, and I got very excited, I'm gonna do this dream project. But over the next couple of months of just talking, no money spent, no funds raised, um, I realized that it was gonna be impossible to stand before you and say that the reason why the film isn't as good or something, there, there were just going to be complications. And so I just politely wrote them a letter and said, you know, I'm really not the person right now uh, to do this. And uh, that's the one that still I, I sort of hold out there, that if circumstances change, that I'd like to do that. He's an extraordinary, complicated uh, human being. And, and as strange as it may seem for someone in a visual medium, it all begins with the word, and this is a person who is a master at words, and I like to hear uh, him talk. Can you repeat that? 
you say that a little bit louder? What's one of your most touching or memorable experiences that come out of storytelling? Um, the, it, what's some of the mo what's a memorable experience that comes out of storytelling? Um, you know, after my first film, I described our process as emotional archaeology. So the simple and glib answer would just say all of it, because we're looking not for the emotion that is the baser kind of sentimentality and nostalgia. Uh, and, and we quite rightfully shrink from that sentimental and nostalgic things. It, it's the enemy of good anything, uh, good politics, uh, good novels, good, good documentary films. Um, but what we more often than not do is a mistake as well, is we rush willy-nilly to the rational world in which one and one always equals two. And we feel a kind of safety in the empiricism of that. Um, what we do know is that if we look deep within ourselves, the things that compel us are kind of higher emotions. Uh, the relationships we have, the passions that we experience and, and direct our lives. And, and that's what we're interested in touching in the stories that we do. I had one experience at the end of the Civil War series where we were mixing the soundtrack. What you heard there in most of the films is unmixed. You know, we just have narration and music and maybe a little bit of sound effects. When we're finished sound editing, we might have 50 sound effects, three music tracks, three narration tracks, three voice tracks, all that has to be mixed down and finely calibrated so you can hear every word but not miss the punctuation of a car driving by or a basket uh, hitting a, a, a metal hoop in, in Harlem. Um, so we were putting all that together in the last, I mean, it's hugely expensive process. Back in 89 when we were mixing the Civil War, I think it was $1,000 an hour. And we were mixing for like 19 days. You can imagine what inflation does. I mean, it's huge, the money going through the meter. So we were on the last episode and we were editing the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And we laid down the narration, we laid down the first person voices, we laid down the music. We laid down the, we'd gotten uh, a theater company to perform Our American Cousin, the play that was being performed at, at, at uh, Ford's Theater when Lincoln was assassinated. And it's a, tin, you know, a, 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 a Victorian comedy, just dreadful. Augusta, dear, be gone. Door slams, foot poundings, all of that sort of stuff. In fact, Booth fired when uh, they said the funny line that got the biggest laugh, you sockdologizing old man trap didn't seem to be funny then, and it certainly isn't funny now. But the huge burst of applause and, and sort of laughter uh, muffled, to some extent, the shot uh, that he fired in the back of Lincoln's brain. Um, and we laid down everything except the sound of a gunshot. And it's analog, not digital back there. We were rolling reels, you know, 25 reels of, of sound and one reel of picture back and forth, adding, subtracting, elevating sounds. So, but we hadn't done the the gunshot. So he went back, you know, the several seconds and put it in. I remember one of the people I was working with turned like very anxious and I and then the and then the mixer who doesn't work for me uh, turned and I said stop and he hit the stop button and it came up to rest on where just before the sound of the bullet came. And we just sat there and looked at each other. This five and a half year effort coming to an end a few days before Christmas 1989 we um, just sat there and wept, and we kept Lincoln alive. And then I nodded, and he backed up again, and we laid down the sound of the gunshot, and we went on and finished the film and went home to Christmas, and then, you know, like that. But there was this few minutes where we just stopped, all of us, in complete silence, just moved beyond belief, where we felt that, that we had that power uh, to keep him alive. And I always remember that as one of the best moments of this business that we're in of telling stories. Yes? I know that you developed a great relationship with Buck O'Neill, and uh, I'm really impressed that he was never bitter about not playing in the major leagues in white baseball. And I wonder if he shared any nuggets of wisdom in terms of how he was able to say, always say that he was born right on time. Um, you know, this is a question about Buck O'Neill, the Negro League star who was the heart and soul of our series, uh, and a question about his bitterness. He would never got to play Major League Baseball because of the color of his skin. Um, I, I've spent a good deal of time with him, and, and maybe second only to Jerry. He was very much a mentor and a friend, my 
kids considered him the grandfather. Um, we had many experiences together. He was, in fact, uh, the first black coach, third base coach, in the major leagues for the Chicago Cubs, and was in line to be promoted uh, to uh, the general manager, but he hadn't graduated from high school because the area that he grew in, Sarasota, Florida, had refused black kids in the high school. And so it went to a white person, and it was one of these great regrets. He was also a, a huge advocate for the Negro Leagues, and in the last year that the Veterans Committee basically pushed in about 25 old Negro, Negro Leaguers for some political behind-the-scenes reasons that we don't completely know because it's a secret ballot, he was left off, and he would have been obviously the leader of that class. And he went to Cooperstown and sang them into the Hall of Fame without a single sort of sour note. He was a remarkable person, and I spent a lot of time with him on the road, and he made you feel as if he woke up that day to see you. Our, our religious teaching, some of our religious teachings suggest that man is made in God's image, and almost the entire history of humankind suggests that that is not so. <laughs> Buck is one of those great examples where you go, oh yeah, it's possible to be, you know, higher than that. And uh, I remember once we were driving from Lockhart, Texas, which has really great barbecue, to uh, back to Austin where we were doing something. And he was telling me and a friend about the time he hit for the cycle in the Negro Leagues. And we we're looking off to the west. We're driving north from Lockhart. And off to the west is like a tornado, you know, or something that we think is going to turn into a tornado because the sky is green. It's not black, it's green, and it's just freaking us out, but it's sunny where we are, and we're driving along, and Buck is just oblivious to us all, and he was talking about this time that he hit for the cycle, and you know, he got a double, and he hit a home run, and uh, then he hit a triple, and you know, and, um, no, 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 what, 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 no, he had hit, he'd hit a ball, he'd already collected everything that he needed except a triple, and he, uh, describes hitting this ball in which it was easily an inside the park home run. And he like rounded third base and he goes, wait a second, I'm about to hit for the cycle and just sort of came up lame a little bit and led it back to third base and, uh, you know, hit for the cycle. So um, he was great. We, I could go on with Buck stories all night, but I'm afraid that, that uh, uh, Peter will tell me we have one more question. Who's got a really good question? Oh, you have a really good question. It's a really informed question at the moment, but with your, with the focus that you've done on American history, do you ever um, have reservations or fears around inspiring nationalism that might have an impact on how we view global issues? It's a really, really good question about whether my pursuit of American history, is there a worry that in these stories about American history, we promote a kind of nationalism that will affect adversely, as Sunim, you're suggesting, our, our relationship to the globe. This has been one of the central fault lines of American history. It's not my fault line, it's not your fault line, but it's something we've all experienced. A lot of it has to do, as I said before, by the unique geography of the United States, that we are so insulated by these two uh, oceans and relatively benign neighbors, that we are the oldest democratic government uh, going on, that we have had uh, more than 200 years of uninterrupted uh, succession of governments without a single troop leaving office. This is unheard of in world history. Uh, we've developed and because of our great economic strength and for, for other sorts of things that have occurred, we've developed what is called the myth of exceptionalism, that we believe in an essential sense that, that we are a kind of chosen people, that we are the greatest nation on earth, that we have done all this stuff. And this is a hugely important um, fault line that you have to deal with. And, and either answer it never really does it. You cannot reject it nor you cannot embrace it. If you embrace it, it's so obvious, the kind of hubris that has gotten us into so much trouble over the course of our history, the arrogance in which we apply our ideas to other people. If you ignore it, if you totally turn it away, you lose also a connection to something that's quite special and not necessarily unique to us, but we can, because we are us, 
have it be that way. And so for someone working in documentary films that happen to be about American history, that's a fault line that you're always trying to dance over. Let us remember that the greatest president we've ever had in an inaugural address to Congress in 1862, in the midst of the greatest crisis in the history of the United States, said, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. And then he goes on to talk about slavery and how evil it is and how important it is to eradicate it. And he will say, we will, me we will meanly new lose or nobly save the last best hope of Earth. And he was referring to this experiment, only four score and six years old, that he was now in the process of trying to uh, keep together in the middle of the Civil War. Um, we have to be suspicious, doubtful. We also have to be willing to embrace the positive aspects of it. I, I fully agree, and you know, this Vietnam Project is an almost daily reminder. It is a daily reminder of the horrific, toxic, metastasized results of what is dangerous about that sense of, of American nationalism or subscribing to this, this, this thing. Uh, we see it in political rhetoric all the time. I mean, it's, it's just so superficially bad and wrong. Um, and at the same time, can you believe that Franklin Roosevelt early in his presidency, could sit there looking at an unfinished work of sculpture, one of the most magnificent works of sculpture ever created. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's really different from a postcard. That has George Washington and now Thomas Jefferson and is soon to have Abraham Lincoln and his fifth cousin, Theodore, inscribed in it. Looking at it, and extemporaneously saying, geez, you know, in 10,000 years, this might be sanded down a tenth of an inch, and I think we'll be in here, and that they would might look back at us favorably and say that we had left a decent land to live in and a decent government to operate under. I mean, boy, if that isn't the beginnings of a manual of operating that is not sentimental, that is not um, naive, but sort of optimistic in a wonderful way. That kind of emotional archaeology is what I'm interested in. And will always have to expose myself, and therefore by extension you, to the pitfalls of not embracing that, but dancing that very fine line between hagiography, hey, hero worship, and exceptionalism, but also the kind of cynicism which is in some ways the even greater enemy that comes from the negative assumption about us collectively and individually. And it's in somewhere between that. You'll see it in the Central Park Five as it develops. You'll see it in the Dust Bowl. You'll, you'll see it obviously in the Roosevelt's. And you've seen it in other films that we've made. It will certainly be the cusp on which the Vietnam film will hinge. But that's, I mean, what a great last question. I knew you were going to ask a good question. Um, that, that, you know, let's just agree to be back in 10,000 years and talk about how much erosion has taken place on Mount Rushmore. Thank you all very much.